you old and batty. Yes. Whenever I preach old and batty, I always have this question. <laughs> what happened or not? <laughs> Talking about grace, this is not a part of the sermon, but uh, if you're talking to someone and they ask you what's the difference between Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and, and uh, Judaism and all that, they're all just different ways to the same place. Have you ever heard that before? Grace is the difference. Christianity is the only grace-based religion in the world. It's different than everything else. In Islam, you die for your God. In Judaism, you perform all kinds of perfunctory genuflection and observe all kinds of feast days that you might possibly please Him. But in Christianity, your God dies for you. Amen. There's nothing else like it on the face of the earth. All right, here's the sermon. <laughs> Have you heard the words emergent church? Yeah, several of you shaking your head yes out there. That's quite a popular catchphrase right now, describing the church as a whole and the world. And uh, what does it mean? The emergent church. I meant to bring my phone up here and let, uh, what's her name? Surrey, I read the definition for you. But I guess I, I'm not comfortable with women at the pulpit, so. <laughs> In my words, in my words, the emergent church is a body of believers that has felt irrelevant to the trends of modernity. Now, modernity is the direction that society has been going ever since about 1960 and continues on to this day. They have felt run over by the God-free society. So now they're playing the game of trying to emerge from that morass. With a program that is more palatable to the unbelieving. Most emergent churches are sacrificing former methods, which I've got no problem with. The church has changed methods down through the ages, and it is built with that flexibility in it so it can meld itself to the different cultures that it finds itself in. Not all methods are good, but most of them I don't worry about. I was in a church one time not too long ago, and uh, I felt that I was walking into a bar. Uh, the lights were dimmed down, so that uh, an old man like me couldn't hardly see where he put his feet. They had smoke machines going throughout the auditorium. They had a praise band that did all the singing. I looked around and then we were singing the songs and, we, and they were being entertained by the praise band. That, that's all a part of methods. You may like that or you may not. But I'm not too worried about the changing methods 
of the emergent church. What I am concerned about is that they have compromised some of the essentials. That the church dare not compromise if it is going to see itself as the church of Jesus Christ. In my classes in California, I had a teacher named Mott Smith. By the way, Dave, he went to the same school I went to out there, Pacific Christian College. Mott Smith was his teacher also. But Mott had a class called Bena and Bena Essa. It's Latin. Why do they, you know, when you get in graduate school, they have to call everything Latin. I don't know why that is. It just simply means good. Bene is good. And bene essa means not only good, but essential. Now, he handed out a paper with about 120 different subjects on it. He said, I want you to write, I look at your neighbor, I want you to write what things you think are good in the church, but not essential. And what things you think are good and essential that we can't call ourselves a church if we don't have it. He got 120 papers back. No two papers were alike. <laughs> No two papers were alike. Church, we are confused about these things. We have mixed up tradition, which has crept into our church, with those things that cannot be changed, those things that are orthodox, and we have mixed them together to the point that we can't tell the difference. We need to clarify what things cannot be changed and what things can be changed if we want to become an emerging church. And frankly, I don't think we need to become an emerging church at this point because there are just too many people that see, do not see the that need to emerge. And Jesus didn't see the need to emerge either. And what did he call the church? He said the church is like a city that was built on a hill and has come running down the hill chasing everybody. This group that, what did he say? He said the church is a city set on a hill. And there it is. Its light shines out. If men be drawn to it, fine. If they don't, it is at their own peril. Did he not say all this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Too many times we have looked at that scripture as the gates of hell attacking the church. But no, it is not. The gates of hell are on the defense against the attacking church. And on this rock I will build my church. That doesn't sound too much to me like he wanted it to move. <laughs> I think he set it up there and he said, if I be lifted up, I will what? I will draw all men to me. <clears throat> so I think there needs to be a place where we are not seeing the need to emerge, but that we are holding on to the essay, the bene essay, 
of the church and drawing men to it. Let me just tell you through the rest of this sermon what I believe are the better essence, the good things that cannot be changed. And if, then if you want to merge, go ahead and merge, but do not mess with that stuff. Okay. <coughs> there are all kinds of ologies under the heading of theology. Theology is a major term, but there are all kinds of ologies underneath that. There's pneumatology study of the Holy Spirit. There's Christology, the study of Christ. There's angelology, the study of angels. There's eschatology, the study of the end times. There is all kinds of ologies under theology. And there's one ology that I bet you never heard of. Soteriology. You gonna, if you've never heard of that, you'll learn something today. Soteriology is the study of how a man is saved. That's an ology that is benefit. It cannot be changed. Many of the emerging churches are changing that ology because there are parts of that ology that are difficult for the emerging society. There are parts of that ology that the hound of fame and fortune just will not So, the emerging church is changing some of the benefit. Let me warn you against that. Soteriology is the gospel once delivered. In Jude, the third verse, there's only one chapter in Jude, the third verse, let me read it for you. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. In other words, it was common all over. There was only one method to be saved for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. This common salvation, it was needed for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith and listen to this last phrase, which was once delivered unto the saints. Now that word once in the original language is apas. <laughs> All right. What does apas feel our own spit? What does apas mean? It means once and then it is ah, ah, it is cut off. Once for all. Some of your Bibles will say that is correct. That word means. I am a dispensationalist because I believe that God gave His revelation in different dispensations to different ages. In the early century, the first century and the first half of the second century in the church, they were under the dispensation of miracles. God gave His people the ability to do miracles and He gave them miraculous Built. Why? Because the Bible had not been written yet. The New Testament was not finished. 
It had not been circulated among the churches. The canon of the 27 books of the New Testament had not yet been collected. And so he gave people miraculous abilities of knowledge, of interpretation, the speaking in tongues was part of that, the prophesying was part of that, but it was all methods of getting his word across to mankind. One of the early church historians by the name of Justin Martyr said those things were ended by 160 A.D. They used to be practiced in the church, but he said they were ended by 160. Why did he say they were ended by 160? Because by that time, the Bible was collected, the 27 books were put together and circulated among the churches. That ushered in the next dispensation. And that is the last day. That is the last dispensation. We no longer need those supernatural things because the Bible is here and it's complete. We need to read the Bible and it will tell us everything we need to know. And it will tell us everything we need to know about being saved. It was once delivered. We need expect no other prophet. Mohammed came along 500 years after Jesus Christ. But we need expect no other prophet because the gospel was once delivered. What does Mohammed have to say to us? Well, it's not in line with what the Bible already said. It's nothing. Joseph Smith, leader of the Mormons, came along. I am a prophet. The angel Moroni is delivering to me in hieroglyphics on golden tablets. The gospel you should have now. No. That gospel was once for all delivered. These are the latter days. They've been the latter days ever since the Bible was finished and circulated among the churches. For almost 1900 years now, we have been in the last days. The Bible calls them the last days, not because, not necessarily because we are close to the second coming of Jesus Christ, but it is the last dispensation, the last revelation that God is going to give to us. When he sent Jesus Christ to earth, Jesus Christ, his words and his life was the full revelation of who God is and who we are supposed to be. And that was it. So we need to believe what God says about the gospel. All those other ologies that I mentioned, they don't have to do only in the sense maybe of overlapping somewhat. They don't have to do with our salvation. But here's the way I figure it. If we get it right on salvation, if we are prepared for the judgment, if God is going to count us as having never sinned, which is justification, all we have to know how to do is to get into that situation to be saved. Then all those other allergies don't mean squat. <laughs> if we're saved, we can get them right or we can get them wrong. But if we get soteriology wrong, then we're in a 
Hot water. <laughs> Here's things that have never changed. A man must hear the gospel. Yeah. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now today, people can read. You can lump that in there too. I know people who have had no church at all, but just the Bible. And they've gotten what they need to know just out of studying that Bible. You need to hear the message of the gospel. You need to believe what you hear about Jesus Christ. Now I would rather use the word in this day and age, trust. Because believe means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And the Bible itself says even the devils believe and tremble. And they know, we know that they're not saved. All they have done is mentally assented to the fact that Jesus is Lord. They have never put their trust in Him as Savior. So I would rather use the word trust there. Trust. I see this songbook here. Pretty solid. I don't want to step on it that way. I will run my illustration if I step on <laughs> But I see that songbook. I judge it trustworthy to hold up my rather corpulent car carcass. <laughs> I have not trusted this book. <laughs> Christian life. 
And he is there to, now I'm going to use another eight-cylinder word, he is there to sanctify you. You have already been justified by what do we talk about at communion this morning? The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Amen. Amen. You have been justified by that. And you remain justified and looked at through rose-colored glasses. But he gives you the double cure. And that second part of that double cure is sanctification as he gives you that Holy Spirit to guide you. The Holy Spirit causes repentance in our life. And it happens every day. And it's got to keep happening every day. I'm not done sinning yet, are you? I thought I was. I had three days there one time. I looked back at and I thought, I am sinned.
We need to repent. We need to confess. We need to tell somebody that's got a pair of ears on the side of their head that can hear. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We need to say that to our brothers and sisters. We need to say that to a Muslim who might come to this back door and want us to convert. We need to say that to our friends. Here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus is the one and only Christ, the anointed one of God. The living God. The God who still exists. The God who is still watching and leading over us. Then, another thing we cannot sacrifice is being baptized. Being immersed in water. Baptizo is Immersion. That's what the word means. It is made to picture a death, a burial, and a resurrection. That's the picture God is trying to paint to us in baptism. And when God paints a picture, I would not go up to it and I'd say, I think it needs to tweak it down. <laughs> He paints a picture. We better leave it alone. So let us be immersed. It is commanded. It is one of those things we cannot do away with if we are emerging as a church. Oh, I see so many that emerge as a church that are downplaying this business of baptism. They say they want to copy the Baptists. Listen, I'm not your preacher anymore, officially. It's like say anything I want about it. <laughs> <laughs> but they want to copy the Baptists. They want to copy all the Calvinists out there. Well, they're not Calvinists. So really, they're really their Zwingli. Zwingli is where they got that. And they got it from the great revivals and the great awakening in this country that took place at the turn of the centuries. There were men who were having meetings out in the tents and when they gave the invitation in, their sermons were so full of fire and they had preached hell hot enough that the aisles were full of people wanting to come. They did away with baptism out there. Because too many people, it's just not convenient. And they get away with it out there. The churches in the city say, we want that kind of response. So I guess we're going to have to do away with baptism too. And that's how it's being done away with. But listen, baptism, if you want to point to a point at which God changes His mind about who you are. That's the important thing. Not what's going on here on earth, but it's when God changes His mind about you. If you want to point to a point at which God changes His mind about you, it's when you hit the water. It's when you hit the water. Because you go down the center you are raised to walk in and do this of life. I can't say it any more clearly than that. You need to be baptized. And don't throw that away. It is in baptism that we receive the double cure. We are justified and we are also given the Holy Spirit to sanctify our life. Be faithful after you're baptized. 
Romans 2, uh, Revelation 2.10 tells us to be faithful unto death and we shall receive the crown of life. I've baptized over 800 people in my ministry. Only 250 of those have stayed. The rest of them got their fire insurance and food. Or so they think. Once they get baptized, they think, okay, now I got the blood of Christ on me. Now I can go just live any way I want. Baloney. Baloney. Be faithful. Get that Bible and start devouring it. When people persecute you, let it roll off your, you like water off the duck's back. What's new? Christians have been persecuted all down through history. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. We're always going to be running against the wind. What is new? What else is new? And that's the way it's going to be. And be at the Lord's table. That's the last one I'm going to talk to you about. Oh, the Lord's table. And faithfulness to the Lord's table. And in the first centuries, it's obvious that they were spreading this, this table each Lord's day. When Paul came to Troas in Acts the 20th chapter and the 7th verse, he must have got there on Sunday night because he waited a whole week so that he could worship with the Christians when they came together to do what? They came together to break the bread. And the definite article is in there. The. Whenever the Bible uses the definite article, the bread, it's talking about the Lord's Son. Some of your Bibles didn't catch that. You've got to go back to the original for you. Each Lord's Day. You know what I hear? I hear that there are emerging churches now who are taking this table and setting it in the back room. Yeah. They are good. And they make a little announcement. And they say, well, if you'd like to take the Lord's Supper today, it's back here in this uh, room, and we'll have a couple elders back there, and I'll be glad to serve it to you. Listen, once this Lord's Supper is not sitting in the center of our auditorium here, and if it's not the central part of our worship service, we have ceased to be the church. That's the hub of the axle right there. Right there. That's why they met together. And that's why we meet together today. We can't do without that. All right. In conclusion, these are the benefits of the gospel. And the church, if it wants to emerge, must not change these. This is the last days. There will be no other prophet with any different gospel that will come. The next thing on the schedule advance of Jesus, precious Christ himself, preparing in his God. And us being gathered unto him. About it. Our invitation to him is going to be page number 653. I have given you the essa of soteriology. If any of you have not completed the essa of soteriology today, then
there's no better time than the present. Let's stand. Let's.